105. And welcome to Power Factor. I'm Rick. I'm here back again at the lovely Renton Fishing Game Club. Liquid sunshine's pouring down as it usually does here in December. But we didn't stop us. We're here at the range and we're going to talk about IDPA order of engagement. If you've shot any IDPA or if you're planning to shoot IDPA, you may have seen or heard uh, phrases like tactical priority, tactical sequence, uh, some people will say tactical order, uh, which is kind of confusing which because that's not really the name of either of them. Um, but when you're engaging targets in IDPA, the order in which the targets are engaged will be based on two theories. Uh, tactical priority is based on the idea that you engage the target that is either nearest or appears first and uh, it depends on whether you're shooting around cover, over cover, or have no cover how you uh, implement tactical priority. So probably 90% of the rounds you fire at a given match are going to be tactical priority so it's best to be most familiar with that. And you're probably normally going to see that when you're pieing around the edge of a vertical uh, edge of cover. Now the phrase pying has a kind of tactical origins and it's carried over into IDPA. And if you imagine um, uh, like uh, the spokes of a wheel where you are at the center and the targets are around the, the rim, as you look past the cover at those targets, you can see kind of a wedge that's downrange. Up close to the cover, you can see hardly anything beyond the actual cover. But as you go further down range, you have a wider field of view, and that forms kind of a wedge. And then as you alter your position, you see another wedge. So you can imagine this pie is forming, and that's why it called, it's called pieing the cover, because you're looking at these successive wedges of what you can see down range as you reposition relative to the cover. And it's usually used for uh, searching a room or something. But anytime you're engaging targets around vertical cover, you're going to be doing this pieing action in order to engage in tactical priority. Now if you're shooting around the left side of cover, tactical priority dictates that if you have targets downrange, uh, an array of targets downrange, that you engage the leftmost target first. Because as you approach the cover and pie the edge, the target on the left will be the one that's visible first and you're concerned with your cover relative to that target. So you're hanging out enough that you can uh, engage T1, and depending on the spacing, you could possibly lean out enough again to get T2, and it, it may be even a third target, depending on how widely spaced they are. Uh, but you may have to kind of shuffle your feet in order to, to change your perspective enough to see each target. But when you're shooting around the left side of cover, in tactical priority, it's always going to be left to right, regardless of how distant or near the targets are. When you're shooting around the right side, it's going to be right to left for the same reason. As you're approaching the edge of the cover, the outermost target is going to be visible first. So if you always think of it as outside in, that applies to either shooting around the left side or the right side. Now what happens if you don't have a vertical surface to pie? What if you're, say, shooting over a horizontal surface? Uh, could be a table, could be a car fender, and you have no cover at all. And now, how does tactical priority work? Uh, if there's no cover and you're exposed to all of the threats at the same time, then tactical priority dictates that you engage the nearest target first. That's assumed to be the, the gravest threat. Um, it used to be there were some shenanigans that went on with threat indicators. You'd see targets with uh, guns or knives or various things stenciled on them. Some people tried to get uh, the order of engagement based on the perceived threat level based on the uh, weapon that was stenciled on the target. So you had guys doing things like saying, 
Well, a guy who's 10 feet away with a knife is more dangerous than a guy who's 20 feet away with a gun. And another guy would say a guy who's 20 feet away with a gun is more dangerous than a guy who's 10 feet away with a knife. So you had all this, again, tactical thinking inserted by the stage designer and there was little consistency. So IDPA stepped in and said you can put threat indicators on the target, but you can't use those to determine uh, engagement order. You have to stick to tactical priority, which in this case would be near to far. Now we have a little target array down range which shows three targets near to far, uh, kind of an echelon formation. And it's, there's kind of a wrinkle in the rule that says if the targets are less than six feet difference in distance from you, you can engage either one. So for instance, if those three targets were spaced at five feet, 10 feet, and 15 feet, I don't have to shoot the nearest one first because the second one is only five feet further away than the closest one. If they were spaced at six feet, 12 feet, and 18 feet, then I would be required to shoot the nearest target, the middle target, or the most distant target. So in this case, let's say the spacing is five feet. If I wanted to, I could shoot T2 before I shoot T1 because T1 is five feet away, T2 is 10 feet away, for instance. Five foot difference, I have a choice. The problem with that, though, is then you get into kind of weird transitions. Instead of, you know, a near target, a short transition to the second target, a short transition to the third target, you'd be going uh, middle, in close to the near one, and then a long transition out to the farthest one, and there's, it's not very efficient, uh, kind of wasted motion, so you don't want to do that. You can do that. You could have a situation maybe where the middle target uh, was a steel popper that acted as an activator, and you might want to get whatever it's going to activate started. So you might, you know, decide, okay, I want to shoot that activator first. And if the difference in distance is only five feet, if the target uh, in the middle is less than five feet away, less than five feet further away uh, than the closest one, six feet is, uh, it's at five feet, you can go ahead and shoot that middle one first. But then now you're committed to going to the nearest one, then the farthest one. And, and again, unless you've got a kind of a weird situation where there's some advantage to shooting the middle target first, a clear advantage to doing so, you probably are just going to want to go near to far. Um, uh, if you're uh, engaging over a tabletop, it's the same situation. Uh, you've got to be covered, as always, 50% of your torso. Um, but you have the same option if the targets are at equal distance of shooting them in any sequence uh, or if they're in this kind of an echelon pattern as long as the difference in distance is less than six feet you can go uh, middle near far uh, but again you know just straightforward near to far makes sense. Now you'll occasionally see an engagement order called tactical sequence. And tactical sequence uh, dictates that each target is engaged once before any target is engaged more than once. And again, another kind of a tactical theory that says if you take the time to put, say, two rounds on T1, two rounds on T2, your third threat will have enough time to get you before you've got time to, to engage it. So this theory of tactical sequence says everybody should get one round and then you can come back for the second round or third round depending on what's required. Um, and I've heard it variously described, uh, the, kind of the shorthand version that you'll hear people that use to describe it uh, is based on the theory that there's three targets to be engaged with two rounds each. So tactical sequence is described as one, one, two, one, one. And that just means the first target gets around, the second target gets around, the third target, after you've put one round on it, you've satisfied the requirement of putting one on each. So you can go ahead and put a second round right away on the third target, then come back to the second one with a round, back to the first one with a round, so it ends up one, one, two, one, one. So when you hear that phrase, imagine it's an array like this with three targets to be engaged two each in tack sequence. T1 gets a round, T2 gets a round, T3 gets two back to T2 for a round and finish off with one round on T1.
Now you're not required to do it that way. As long as every target is engaged with one round, before any target is engaged with the second round, you could go one, 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 transition back to T1, and go one, one, one again. But again, you're wasting motion on that long transition from T3 back to T1. So it makes more sense to go left, right on the first pass, and then right to left again on the second pass. And that's another thing about uh, whether you prefer to engage left to right or right to left. If you say had to reload in the middle of the uh, array, let's say uh, you put one round on each and you're at slide lock and you have to reload uh, before you can put a second round on each target. Uh, I prefer to engage left to right all the time when I can. So if I had to do that, perform a reload after engaging each target with one round, I would start over again at T1 so that both paths would be left to right. There's enough time during the reload to set up again on T1 rather than T3. So this 1-1-2-1-1 one, 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 one kind of assumes you're going to fire all six rounds uninterrupted without a reload. But if I were going to shoot it with a reload in the middle, I'd go 1-1-1 one, one, one left to right. During my reload, I'd re-index on T1 and go 1-1-1 one, one, one again left to right. You might also find that there's some strategic reason when you've broken down the stage to engage in a certain order. Uh, let's say after you've engaged the third target, you're going in a certain direction. You might find that going left to right leads you in this direction, going right to left leads you in that direction, so that your engagement order is sort of dictated by what's coming later. And that's one of the reasons you want to pay attention during the walkthrough and think through what your plan is going to be to take advantage of things like that. Another thing, it's not strictly related to order of uh, engagement, but something you uh, need to concern yourself with since the rules addendum came out, is when you're shooting through a port, even though you've just got this short little section of vertical cover, you essentially use this as if it went all the way to the ground. Um, the rule book says you can't stand in the middle of a port and engage. So if I've got three targets out there, I can't stand in the middle of the target and engage them as if I'm shooting over horizontal cover. So in other words, I don't have the option of saying shooting them left to right or right to left, um, standing in the middle of the port. If I'm approaching the port from the right side, I must pie this little vertical surface here and shoot left to right. Likewise, if I were approaching the port from the right side, from the left side, shooting around this side, I would have to engage from right to left and, and pie around the edge of this just as if it were a doorway. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, is that you cannot cross this port. If you Again, another part of the rules addendum, I think the rule book was uh, fairly, it, it was implied, it's very explicit now, you cannot cross this port without engaging the targets visible through the port. So if you're approaching from the right side, you don't have the option of running across and, en and engaging around this side of the cover. If you're approaching the target, the, the port from the right side, you must pie this surface, and then you must engage all the targets that are visible before stepping across. Let's say you needed to go that way to, um, to complete the course of fire. You must engage all the targets from here before crossing this open port. Now we've had some people ask, well, okay, since I can't cross the port, what if I do this? and duck under the port and come up on the other side. I suppose you could do that uh, if you wanted to. Like Because I'm a lefty, I really want to approach the port on this side because this favors left-handed engagement. But if I were a right-handed shooter and I wanted to duck underneath and pop up on the right side, you know, I guess you could do that. Um, I haven't seen anybody ask headquarters if that violates kind of the spirit because you're not really crossing the port and you're moving underneath it. You're not exposing yourself to any threats. And that's the whole point of the rule, is that you not expose yourself to threats that haven't been engaged uh, before crossing this port. But uh, you might want to ask a safety officer on the course of fire and say, hey, do you mind if I duck under here and pop up on the other side uh, and see if they'll let that fly. So another consideration is you notice that as we we're talking about the, the order of engagement, we're not talking uh, about hitting the targets. That's a matter for scoring. We're talking about shooting at the targets. Now, if one of those targets in the array is a steel popper or a steel plate, you're required only to engage the plate, and then you're allowed to move on to the next target. So, for instance, in this array, if the middle target, T2, um, were a popper, if I put one round on T1, one round at the steel plate, 
and miss, you could argue that I must then go to T3 because I have to engage each target with one round before I engage any target with two. So if I go one, miss the steal, your mind tells you, uh-oh, I, I gotta pick up that steel target. If you shoot at it again, you've now violated tactical sequence. Tactical sequence says one round on T1, one round on T2, then you must put a round on T3. Um, and, but then you could also argue because, you know, I missed T2, it, it, the assumption when you're shooting at paper is that you hit it, you know. But the rules say that engagement is shooting around at a target, whether you hit it or not. So if you're, again, and that might be something you want to ask, uh, I, I find that there are safety officers who haven't considered some things that might turn up on a course of fire. And so I would not go into a course of fire set up that way without asking, hey, if I missed that steel target on a tactical sequence engagement with my first shot, can I re-engage it until it goes down? Or must I transition to the next target and then come back to get it? And, and I would say the correct answer is you must uh, bypass the steel if you miss it the first time, move on to the next target, and then get it on the second pass after each target has been engaged with one round. Another thing you might see is a disappearing target that when it appears alters which target must be engaged. If you think that you have to engage, let's say we're standing out in the open with no cover or we're shooting over a horizontal cover surface which allows us to shoot or requires us to shoot near to far, what if there's a swinging target in the middle of the array not the most, not the closest target, and not the most distant target. That when it appears, it changes which target is nearest and which target is farthest. I've seen a, a course of fire where the appearing target comes out right as the shooter is about to engage a static target, but then the appearing target is closer to them than the one that they're planning to engage. So now the question becomes: Can I complete the engagement of the target that I intended to shoot initially? or when the appearing target appears that's now closer to me than that target, must I engage the appearing target while it's available? And that's another, that's another issue that I think you're going to find multiple answers. One answer that you'll get is that it's bad course design. You shouldn't have uh, an appearing target that alters the tactical priority situation like that. It's, it's tough to, for the shooter and it's tough for the safety officer. But if you see something like that, just ask. There's a lot of situations that you, you'll you'll find you can resolve them. Whether you agree with the resolution or not, um, you can resolve them just by asking, hey, you know, can I engage the target that I'm intending to engage and then move to the swinger, or do I have to hit the swinger when it's available because it's the closest? So we had an interesting trivia question a few episodes back concerning IDPA reloads. And the way the question was formed was if you're performing a reload with retention or tactical reload with a revolver, may you, upon removing the partially spent uh, moon clip, drop it in your empty hole as a place to stow it while you complete the course of fire. Now the rule book says, uh, here's, here's from the IDPA rule book glossary as it exists uh, in the middle of December uh, 2012, a, a proper magazine retention. Place for a partially loaded magazine. Oh, that's the other interesting thing, is that uh, the, the question specifically was addressed to revolver reloads, uh, because when you do a reload with your auto pistol, the magazine you're weak hand and the holster is on the opposite side. So it's probably not something that you're going to do, uh, rather than just sticking it in your pocket. Why would you reach across and stick it in the in the holster? So it's really kind of a revolver specific question, because when you pull the reload out on a revolver, the way most people reload the gun the clip ends up in your strong hand. So the holster is actually uh, probably handier to you than any of your pockets. And so if you look at the rule book, there's a lot of discussion in here about how to do a proper reload and how to retain the magazine. There is actually no reference in the rule book to stowing moon clips. Um, every reference in here is to magazines. So you could argue, and it, if, if this were kind of a trick question, I could argue the rule book doesn't even address where, where you can stow moon clips. So you could put it in a holster, you could put it you know, down the front of your shirt, you could put it you know, between your legs, because it literally doesn't say. I'm going to assume that we're going to extrapolate where it's legal to put your moon clip based on what the rule book says about where to put the magazines. 
So again, proper magazine retention. A place for a partially loaded magazine to be stowed before firing the first shot after a reload. These places include pants pocket, vest pocket, jacket pocket, waistband, magazine pouch. The use of specially designed pockets, shirt pockets, upper vest pockets, hands or teeth is not permitted. Now when we put the question out there, um, since I'm, I'm, I shoot a lot more IDPA than some of the guys on the show and uh, some of the guys like Steven don't really shoot it at all, um, whenever we do an IDPA question on the show, I will find the answer and, and post, uh, send an email to the guys, the other guys on the show with a detailed response, you know, like, you'll find the answer on page so and so of the rule book, and here's the answer. And so the day after we recorded the episode, I sent the email out, look, here's the answer. And with the first 10 responses we got were all contrary to what I, I'd said the, the ruling was. And so Larry emails me back. He's like, are you sure about that? You know, because nobody else seems to agree with you. And, and so then I, I looked at the, at the rules and I decided that the, the answer hinges essentially on one word. And that's the trivia question for today. What is the word? No, just kidding. I wouldn't do that to you. Uh, the, the, the ruling is that yes, you may put the moon clip in your holster. And the reason is, is the holster is not included in those places that you're not allowed to put the, the magazine, as the rule book says. Specially designed pockets, shirt pockets, upper vest pockets, hands or teeth are not permitted. The holster's not included in that. Um, now, this is where, this is the key to it. The places that are allowed include the pants pocket, vest pocket, jacket pocket, waistband, or magazine pouch. And people, the vast majority of the people who responded to the question said, the holster is not listed there, so it's not legal. Well, the, the problem with that is the definition of the word include. Include means there's a larger group, and those things that are listed are included in the group. If I were to say, for instance, that the, that the famous actors include Brad Pitt and George Clooney, does that mean there's only two famous actors? No, that just means there's a larger group and those two are included in it. So the same thing with the rule book, the places that it lists are among those that are legal, but it's not an all-encompassing list. If it were an all-encompassing list and you were limited to only putting your magazines or moon clips in those specific places, Instead of include, they would say the list comprises. Comprise means all of them are included, whereas the word include just means here's some examples of places. So the answer to the question is yes, you may drop your moon clip in the holster when uh, performing a uh, retention reload. So there you go, and uh, congratulations to uh, the winner, Ewan Garden. He was one of two people who got the answer right. So Ewan, we're going to send you something worthy of your uh, sniffing out the correct answer to this question. If you have any comments about it, uh, get back to me. Um, if you're on the Tiger team and you think I'm full of it, or uh, you know, let me know. But uh, I, I did extensive searching on kind of places where I would expect to find uh, if there were some kind of variations or clarifications on the rules. I looked at the IDPA forum. I looked at BrianEnos.com. And I didn't find anything to indicate that anybody had ever made a ruling on this particular issue of uh, whether the moon clip can be put in the holster or not. So until or unless somebody says you can't specifically, uh, the rule book does not prevent it. So work on those revolver reloads, drop that moon clip in the holster, and uh, go get them. So that's all we have for this week. Um, contact us on the show, uh, powerfactorshow.com, powerfactorshow.gmail.com. I'm sure if you're familiar with Facebook, you know the Facebook address. Uh, so contact us, like us, ask us questions, hurl insults, and uh, we'll see you next week.